It is just a dream. Tina asked me to address <laughs> the the number one question I get as I go around the world, which is how did this how did this separation happen in the first place? How what what went wrong? How could we end up with fragmentation and separation if, if love and oneness and God is really all that there really is and that this is a, a fictitious dream? How did how did the dream of separation start? And um, in the clarification of terms at the back of A Course in Miracles, uh, Jesus says, the ego will ask many questions that this Course has no answer for. How did the separation occur? To whom did the separation occur? And he goes on to say, in, in, back in the clarification of terms, that he says, an experience will come that will end your doubting. An experience will come that will end your doubting. He doesn't say a theology will come <laughs> that will end your doubting. In fact, he goes even on to say uh, in Lesson 189 of his workbook, it's really a call into the stillness of God's love. You know, simply do this, be still, lay aside all thoughts of what you are, what God is, all things you've learned from the past hold on to nothing. He says in there, forget this world, forget this course, and come with open arms unto your God. And really he's saying, come and join me in this experience of the Kingdom of Heaven. That, that the book and the words are tools that the Spirit can use while you believe in words while you believe in these separate images, you're going to have to be led step by step back to this pristine state of pure oneness and pure love. But I will make an attempt at this question because people ask these questions a lot, like, you know, how, how can this happen in the first place? How can you get error from truth? How can you get separation from oneness? You know, what is the source of the ego is another way that people say, you know, what is the source of the ego? And the ego does not have a source. Uh, it, it is a, a belief. Jesus said, you made the ego by believing in it, and you can dispel it by withdrawing your belief from it. So it's almost like a parasite, <laughs> or something that you have to simply just not, don't feed it anymore with your faith. Don't feed it with your mind's energy. But to address the question, how did the separation occur? I'll roll it all the way back to 1965 when Helen Shuckman and Bill Thetford are taking down the shorthand notes uh, on the, in the black binders uh, from Jesus. And they take down quite a few of chapters. And as they get into the chapters uh, quite a ways, they, of course, had this question as well as everyone else. So they, they did say to Jesus, Could we just stop and hold on here for just a minute? Could I just ask one tiny question? <laughs> How did this happen in the first place? So now they're, they're taking it down as a dictation from Jesus. So they asked, they asked Jesus directly. And he said, he said, well, you can tell by your emotions in this world, by your daily emotions, fluctuating emotions, that you believe that the separation happened. Because of all the, the fluctuation of fear and guilt and happiness and all kinds of things mixed in there, that you believe that it happened. So the Course is written at the level of belief. It's written to address the mind that believes that the separation has happened. It's not this is an actual world, an actual real world, with actual existence. But I use the analogy like when you go to sleep at night and you have what we'll call nighttime dreams, don't they seem real while you're dreaming them? And don't you have a different experience of them in the morning when you wake up? Even if you were dreaming a nightmare, 
and you are right in the middle of experiencing a nightmare and you wake up, it's usually with a sigh of relief, like, thank God that isn't real. And what we're learning from the Course in Miracles is that what seems to be our nighttime dreams, which we would say are more figments of imagination with different archetypes that Jung talked about and different emotions certainly and colors and so on and so forth, that our nighttime dreams and what we would call daily life as experience, daily life on planet Earth, that they're, they are the same, that both are generated from this belief in separation, both are generated from this underlying sense of fear and it's not surprising that our nighttime dreams and our daily lives have threads of fear running through them. Lots of threads of fear. In fact, I actually got to a point in my life where I started to take a look at the motivation underneath my actions and the motivation for the things I was doing in my life. And I think it was the Spirit saying to me, look at your life in this world and and ask yourself honestly how much of it is motivated by fear. Fear of consequences, fear of, of not having enough, fear of loss. I mean, when you really start to honestly look at the motivations, it was staggering to me. Thought, wow, would I, would I be doing and behaving in the ways that I'm behaving and doing those things if, if it wasn't for fear? And my conclusion was, no, I, I would live a whole different life if it was not for fear. If it was totally inspired by love and joy, it would, it would look a different way. My behaviors would be very, very different. So then I began to start to really look inside at, at the fear and go, go, what is really going on in my consciousness? And, and then Jesus was working with me through the Course saying, well, you're not afraid of all the things you think you're afraid of, that you're dreaming you're afraid of, that is all just a smokescreen, that is all just a, a distraction away from what you're really afraid of. And I'm like, what is it that I'm really afraid of? Give it to me straight. And he said, love. I said, no way, <laughs> I'm afraid of love. I, I love love. <laughs> I, I adore love. I am not afraid of love. There's no, you don't know you actually are terrified of love and the reason you're terrified of love is because you still are identified with the ego and the ego is afraid of love. The ego is afraid love would dispel it and it would. <laughs> it's like the ego's fear of not existing and being dispelled by love and as long as you remain identified to the ego you feel its feelings. So it's really not your real feelings, your true feelings of peace, happiness, love and joy, but as long as you're identified with the ego, you will feel its feelings. And underneath all the fears of whatever in the world, losing your job or losing a loved one or cancer or tsunamis and hurricanes and tornadoes, behind all of that, that's just the smoke screen, there's a fear of love, a fear of divinity and it's the ego's fear. So then, at the beginning I just said, I don't get it. I just can't get that. Don't get that at all. Afraid of love. I, I still say I adore love. <laughs> I'm not afraid of love. And can you come at it from another angle? And he said, well, if, if you look at it, you're afraid of and you're defending against divine love and God, you are actually I said, what, what am I defending for? What am I trying to protect in this defensing, defending against love? And it was the self-concept. You're still trying to hold on to an egoic self-concept that you feel love would dissolve away, and it would. And so whenever you feel resistance to this movement of love in your life, it's simply you're clinging to self-concepts that God didn't create, and you're still generating fear and guilt from clinging on to these idols, to these God substitutes, to this, that which was made to take the place of divinity. That's where it's happening. Ah, oh, thank you. So in other words, it's kind of like that movie, I Heart Huckabees. Has anybody seen I Heart Huckabees? It's a, 
It's a movie with uh, Lily Tomlin and Dustin Hoffman where they play existential detectives who are helping their clients, assisting their clients dismantle their faulty perception of reality and empty their minds of everything that they think is real and true. Very funny, very hilarious. It's a beautiful awakening movie. It's a quantum, it's got a lot of quantum ideas in it. And it's very funny because, because uh, they actually have the existential detectives working to help the clients dismantle their faulty perceptions of reality. And then there's this woman from France who comes who's trying to teach them that the world and everything is chaos. And they better just accept chaos as reality. They, she's like playing the ego character and it's it's quite they run away from they run from one, you know, it's it's just the whole journey of, of the world. So I would say that if if ever that thought arises in your mind about how did this happen in the first place? Know that you're working with a curriculum that will show you and demonstrate you in experience that the separation never happened. It will dissolve the question through an, an enlightenment experience. You are meant for enlightenment. You are meant for salvation. The Christians call it salvation. Uh, you are meant for that oneness and you will have an experience of that that will dissolve the question. It's the ego that's asking the question and it's the experience that will ultimately dissolve away the question. The question is solved in what Jesus calls the atonement and that's the correction for the error. So the whole point of this whole journey through time and space is simply for one thing, to accept the correction for the error. Some of us have grown up in Christian households and I don't think mom and dad and the minister on Sunday called, called it error necessarily. It's called sin. <laughs> Sin's a word we're much more, you know, familiar with. You know, you have sinned. Yipes. Most people have like an aversion to that, that word. But, but actually if you take this, the word sin and you take it back through the Aramaic, you know, it just means missing the mark. Imagine you were sh shooting arrows to a bullseye and you were hitting it here and here and then boom, you hit the target. That would be the correction. And the sin would just simply be missing the mark. Not a black mark on your soul and you'll burn in hell for eternal damnation. You know, the ego can really generate some pretty wild concepts and in, in interject them into religion. It's simply missing the mark. And so then sin, the word sin is simply defined in A Course in Miracles as an error to be corrected. Doesn't that sound a lot softer? Instead of you will burn in hell, ah, there's an error to be corrected. Okay. That's, that's light and breezy. Uh, that sounds more attainable than trying to erase a black mark on your soul. So you realize that, that you're working towards the correction, which is called the atonement in the Course of Miracles. Atonement might be equated as with uh, complete escape from the past and a total lack of interest in the future. Isn't that lovely? I mean, most of us can relate to a complete escape from the past. We know that the past haunts us, so wouldn't that be nice to be free of the haunting memories of oh, what I said or what I did and all my family secrets and all these different things. A complete escape from the past, but also a total lack of interest in the future, which lends us to loosening from these ego beliefs in kind of ambition and future goal setting and so forth, which are so heavily ingrained in the mind that's asleep, you know. You know, can you imagine growing up and and sitting there at the family dinner table and, you know, answering the question, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? Nothing. <laughs> uh, what goals do you have in life? None. Uh, I don't think it would go over, it wouldn't have gone over real well, you know, at the dinner table because, you know, it's, it was all goal setting and, and future, 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 
gain, attain, achieve, strive, better, ambition, ambition, ambition. Or it was just a, a short future event. Like my sister was very, very picky, very persnickety with her foods that she would eat. And cauliflower was not on one of those desirable <laughs> foods. So I remember they'd bring out the cauliflower with whatever, meat and potatoes, Midwestern, you know, and, and I would, and so I'd eat it. And then she would kind of get in these stoic stances of not eating the cauliflower. And it was, it might have well been World War II or World War I. It was a battle of wills, you know. It was the parental will, you will eat the cauliflower. There are starving children in China. There are people that don't, I mean, well, you heard all the, there are people, Used them. there are less advantaged people that don't even have the, the opportunity to eat the cauliflower. And, and she would say, it smells. I don't want to eat it. It's a smelly vegetable. I don't want to eat it. Anymore. Then the threats came in. No dessert. And, and no allowance. Or no, you know, you can't play with your friend. You know, it's like, it's like bringing the heavy artillery. And she goes, no, I'm not going to eat the cauliflower. And then you sit there at that table. You sit there. You're not leaving the, you know. I would sit there and go, man, this is a war. This is like a psychological war over a piece of cauliflower. You know. And then it would go down from the whole thing of cauliflower. You are not leaving the table. So you clean your plate and then some concessions made. Okay, you have to taste the cauliflower. No, she would not. No, it was like a war going on there, back and forth. And you see, it was all about a future event. Even then, it wasn't talking about two years away, three years, it was just about this future event of what was going to happen to that piece of cauliflower. You see, you have to, in order to have peace of mind and live in, as Eckhart says, the power of now, you have to let go of your investment in the future. Why? Because the future is just a projection of the past. It's really the same old, same old. It's just that the ego has convinced us that the future is different from the past. That the past has already occurred and the future is yet to come. Although some of you probably have, have known psychics who have been able to prevent, pre, pre, preview, uh, present things that are about to come in your life with pretty good accuracy. And there's people like Nostradamus and different ones that seem to be able to do that even centuries in advance. How can you predict the future? People still marvel at, how can you possibly predict the future? It's only difficult if you believe the future has not yet happened. If you start to get an inkling that you're watching a pre-arranged script that has already been written, and every move you're going to make the rest of your life is already destined, then it's a little bit different picture how psychics can predict the future. Because they aren't predicting the future, they're just reading the past. They're just reading a future seemingly view of the past. And, and people say, well that doesn't sound very freeing. You mean my whole life and form is completely destined? Well, there's no free will in this world. And the only freedom that we can truly have is when we free our mind from the ego belief and quit holding on to this linear perspective of time because the ego invented linear time to keep us asleep and dreaming so we wouldn't know eternity. And the ego doesn't want us to find the escape hatch. It wants to keep us locked in the nightmare, locked in the dreaming of this nightmare. So the more you get into this, the more you start to realize that <coughs> I do need to let go of all of the past and I do need to let go of my interest in the future. Another reason why why the mind, when it's asleep, will try to predict and control future events is because it seems like a safety device. Like, uh, why would people spend thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars in insurance money? Why would you, why would people, when we talk about money, why would you invest so much money in insurance unless you were trying to ward off these negative outcomes that happened in the past that could possibly occur in the future and so you put all this investment in 
what seems in this world to be very practical, insurance. But the more you f study A Course in Miracles and the deeper you go with it, you start to, to really look at what is going on with insurance. Well, insurance is like is putting down money and resources to try to, to guard against, uh, we'll call them negative future <coughs> outcomes. But you actually are, it's like a wager, you're actually putting a bet down that they will occur. You know, when you have life insurance, you know, you're putting a bet down that you're going to die, that's the first thing, and that the only way you collect, or your family collects, is to die. You have to, you have to have the outcome that you're wagering on occur in order to collect. The only way you can get health insurance and collect on it is if you get sick. You know, if you're well, you're not going to collect any health insurance money. Gonna, what do you get out of here? There's other sick people that need that money. Get out of here. If you're well, you don't collect. So really you're betting against yourself. Every time you you wager against something in the future, you're, you're betting that it will happen and that you'll collect on it when it does happen. Absolutely insane when you start to look at at the impossibility of linear time and you start to look at these crazy ego beliefs. So what's the alternative? Following the Holy Spirit, feeling true health, true joy, true happiness, and eventually, if you follow it all the way, eternal life. Now that's a, that's a life insurance policy you can deal with. Uh, what? I follow it, I forgive, and I wake up to eternity. Yeah. What's the premium? It takes willingness and readiness. It doesn't take all of those other things that the ego would say are so important. It takes willingness and readiness to cash in on your life insurance policy and wake up to true life, which is spirit. Life is, is just a word that gets used in this world. Um, these are, the body's kind of like a puppet, so it's like, you know, to think that a puppet is life is, is far off from the truth. Some of you are aware of Plato's cave analogy, very famous Plato cave analogy, where you know there's the shadows on the wall and the prisoners are all changed and they're chained down and all they see are the shadows. So that's all they know of life are just these shadows flickering on the wall until someone comes in unchains them, takes them out, and says, no, there's a fire out there, and there's these puppeteers, and what you're perceiving is just a bunch of shadows. It's not reality at all. So, you know, in this world, we could say that when we're caught up in perceiving that these images and these, these shadows have reality, that's where it gets to be a drama. And when we start to realize that, that we can forgive the beliefs in our mind, the thoughts, the attack thoughts that are producing the shadows, then we see the shadows in a whole different way. And we know our self, our true being, is life. So, there's a line in the Course that says, you are the, are the goal that the world is searching for. Isn't that an amazing line? You, not your personality self, but the real you, is the goal that the world is searching for. And it can be found, but it, it can be found through forgiveness. That's what the, the whole teachings are.